Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our webinar, Revenue Diversification, What's Possible, co-hosted with Thriving Nonprofits. My name is Kavita Dogra. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Communications and Development Manager here at ONN. If you're new to ONN, welcome. We are the provincial network for Ontario's 58,000 nonprofits and charities focused on policy, advocacy, and services to strengthen Ontario's nonprofit sector as a key pillar of our society and economy. If you are already a member of ONN, welcome back. Thank you for your support. Our public policy research and advocacy work would not be possible without you. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can type the issue into the chat box and our team will respond as soon as possible. We encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A box. You are also welcome to share comments and learnings on social media. To answer our most common question, you will receive an email with the recording of this webinar uh, and relevant resources in one week. Please note that Christy's slides will not be shared, so feel free to take notes as needed. To ground our webinar today, I want to begin with acknowledging the we are meeting on unceded and unsurrendered land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from time immemorial. The ONN office is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. As you may notice, I'm not in the office today uh, and tuning in from my home. I'm grateful to live, work, and play on and within treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and Williams Treaty signatories of the Mississauga and Chippewa Nations. At ONN, we believe that as nonprofits, we must take seriously our role in responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action. On a personal note, uh, I'm the child of two immigrants who moved here from India. And though I was born here, I spent my formative years in India and have always considered myself a global citizen. As we bear witness to ongoing genocides and multiple humanitarian crises in the world, like in Palestine, Congo, Sudan, and more, in the last few months especially, I've been interrogating the ways in which I, myself, uphold systems of oppression and learning how I can help dismantle them. I've been thinking a lot about what it means for me to stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples on Turtle Island, but also around the world, and how I can tangibly support ideas of land sovereignty and decolonization. It's June, which is also National Indigenous History Month, so a great opportunity for all of us to learn uh, about the history of our lands, but also the joy and the art and the beauty that Indigenous peoples bring to our lives. Now, over to the topic at hand. The data is clear, and the trend for years has been that charitable giving is going down. According to the Giving Report by Canada Health, for the 11th year running, the number of Canadians making charitable donations has declined. At the same time as the number of people donating to charities has decreased, the number of people seeking help from charities has soared. One in five Canadians was using charitable services to meet essential needs. Our provincial data here from ONN is aligned with these findings and our state of the sector survey is open now. I do urge you to fill it out. Um, but year over year, we have noticed that the demand for nonprofit services is high, but the funding for our work isn't keeping pace. So what do we do? Christy um, has some helpful insights. So Christy brings 20 years of leadership experience in the nonprofit sector, including 10 plus years as an executive director. Christy is an expert at operational transformation, diversifying revenues and partnerships that create systems level change. Christy co-founded Scale Collaborative to support the empowerment of the impact sector. She inspires and coaches leaders on how to find the right revenue for their missions, shifting their internal culture from a scarcity approach to abundance thinking. Inside the Scale family of organizations, KR is the Director of Partnerships and Programs and the Board President of Thrive Impact Fund. Over to you, Christy. Thank you very much, uh, Kavita, and I really appreciate you grounding us so 
um, well and where we are and our thoughts of where we come from and how we can interact and really be allies and promote and be part of the change that needs to happen um, in our own country, but around the world as well. So I do want to acknowledge that I'm uh, joining you today from the Laguancan speaking peoples. It's now known as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nation. And we are uh, thrilled. I have a colleague here as well, Stephanie Jacobs. And we're just thrilled to be able to join with you to get today and have a conversation, share some learnings that we're seeing in the sector, and um, hopefully have some time for conversation discussion at the end. Um, so I will just really appreciate how some people are kind of adding where they're coming from. So it's always great to know who you're in community with. And so if you want to throw in your organization of where you are in the chat box, and let's also find out who's here. Are you an executive director? Are you staff? Are you a board member? Or are you something else that's really interested in how you can play a part in empowering and really supporting this sector? So great to love it. We've got Paula here, Jamie, executive director. We've got some directors of engagement, um, some other co-chairs, co-founders. Love it. So really great to just get to see who we're with today, which is really nice. So I want to make sure we're all in the right place. <laughs> so I want to ask, do you need more financial resources to do your work? So that's a yes or no in the chat box. Lots of yeses, tons of yeses. And are you tired of sort of being on that hamster wheel of constantly trying to figure it out. And you're looking at how do you embed the long-term sustainability inside your organization so you can sort of get off this constant hamster wheel. Yes and yes. Love it. hundred percent. Great. But well, we're in the right place. And so am I. So that's fantastic. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about really about organization trans transformation, and that takes generating revenues. It's very interesting in our sector because it, you know, talking about money can be an uncomfortable topic for many in our sector, and that's really around this long held beliefs that we've sort of held or been held in around generating revenue and profits and money in our sector. But today I wanna to just invite us all to come from a place of curiosity because money is value neutral. It is what we do with money that matters. And you are actually doing incredible work with money. You know, you're creating our vibrant cities, meaningful jobs, and we're tackling today's most challenging problems. So, are we good to be sitting in curiosity today? Is that a yes? All right. Love it. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen here. And we'll begin. So first off, I just want to give a quick acknowledgement and thank you to ONN. We are big fans over here at Scale Collaborative, and we just really value the work that they do on behalf of our sector to really help us have the kind of knowledge we need to be able to make change. So thanks, Kavita, and the whole team at ONN for your work and for bringing us together today. I want to ground uh, us into why I am here today. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Scale Collaborative, which is really a family of organizations. And so our co-founders, all our directors, and most of our staff are former executive directors, we're board members, and we're staff of nonprofits. So we all used revenue diversification strategies to create and grow exponentially our impact. And that is why we came together to bring Scale Collaborative forward to create the tools, the resources, and the expertise our sector needs to figure it out. You know, we are an incredible group of very high capacity leaders, our whole sector. And so we wanted to bring those tools 
and the resources and the expertise you need to be able to, to figure this out in your organizations. So we created a program. It's by nonprofit leaders for nonprofit leaders. And that's really been serving the sector now for seven years. And it's now been informed by over a thousand of our nonprofit leaders in our country. And it's tailored exactly for the incredible high capacity people, the executives, the staff, and the board members of our sector to figure out revenue diversification. So it's the Thriving Nonprofits Program, and you're going to hear me reference it throughout our webinar today because it works. It's helped over 350 organizations, and, has, and it's grown from being a once-a-year cohort program to it's becoming one of Canada's top learning and innovation hubs for nonprofits. It offers the cohort program for organization, a self-paced version for individuals, access to coaching, and an online community of over 600 of our nonprofit leaders and staff and board members, just like you, who are all leveraging each other's wisdom as we figure out financial sustainability in our own organizations and how we transform our sector. So I'm super excited to be here. So are you ready? Let's get into it. Oh, I'm gonna stop that there. So I'm gonna say that most people raise their hands um, in the chat box to want to have more resources. So what would you do with the resources if you had more of them? You can write it in the chat box. I'm going to say what we hear over and over again, right there. Christine hit it. Ellen, uh, uh, Haba, cover operational costs, hire more staff, increase the capacity to deliver our programs, do more programs, right? Be able to pay appropriately in our sector so people can stay for their life, give benefits, right? Better compensation. Love that, Tara. Thank you, Shelly. Build capacity. This is what we see as we work with organizations all across Canada over and over. It is the same thing. This is what we would do with the resources. So how do we get there? Just wondering why this doesn't want to. There. You always have those moments of technical funniness when you're delivering something. So there we go. So let's start. So I know that we could spend hours on the challenges faced by our sector, um, but they are trends that have been affecting our sector for 20 plus years and they're getting worse. So I think we can agree that we're all facing a lot of challenges to do more work with less resources. Yes, are we in agreement with that? In the chat box, yes or no? And so what does it take to transform to have the resources you need to do, to do your work? This quote from the Moat Center for Policy Innovation really sums it up quite well. Thank you. Everybody realizes that we need more resources. Charities and nonprofits rely on three core sources of revenue, government funding, philanthropy, and earned income. Of these three sources though, only earned income offers any prospect for growth over the long term. So in our experience, this statement has now been true for a couple of decades and it's getting progressively worse. And so the more organizations rely on those, only on those traditional streams of funding and philanthropy, the harder it is becoming to cover overheads have the staff you need, never mind being able to invest in technology or the systems and processes you need or to long-term growth. So if we know that earned income is the opportunity, how do we know what's possible? Like what are the considerations and how do we integrate those revenues into your own organization? So feel free to take lots of notes and we're going to talk a little bit. This is the Thriving Nonprofits Honeycomb model. It's really a broader financial model that starts to look at what's possible when many diverse revenue streams are contained within one or they're owned by one organization. So what do we know for sure? 
We know that having a variety of revenue streams allows you to be more financially stable and focused on your core mission. And whereas having that heavier reliance on grants and contracts to try and cover these operating expenses, it can really sometimes force us to go into mission drift. A diversified revenue stream also allows you to grow and build resources and assets that help you plan for your future, right? They help you navigate those financial ups and downs that are really beyond our control. Because when one stream fluctuates, you know, another stream is there to help balance things out. And that's the key to resilience. So here are three, three things we know. Most organizations will already be using some or all of the more traditional revenue strategies on the left-hand side. But it's the combination of both sides that together build financially strong and resilient organizations. Two, finding the right revenue diversification mixture is different for each organization. And three, Historically, the nonprofit sector tends to have many limiting beliefs about money, about risk that can prevent your organization from opening the door to the type of thinking needed to explore opportunities for developing different types of revenue. So before you can begin figuring out revenue diversification, it's important to take a step back and talk about your organizational culture and beliefs about money and risk. So this is a fun exercise that we can do to open up some conversation. So what I would ask is let's start with money. Take a moment now, and I want you to think about your organization, your culture in there, and your limiting beliefs towards money. And we all have something somewhere in our organizations. Ask yourself, what is the single biggest limiting belief my organization has about money? So I want you to take a moment and I want you to share it in the chat box. Carolyn, operating from a scarcity mentality. Absolutely. This culture of scarcity, d deficits and depths are dangerous. We should do more with less, right? Poverty mentality, over optimism. Grants can solve all the problems. I love this, right? You know, we hear, these are the, the same sort of things we hear, right? We shouldn't charge fees for our programs or services or any type of financial risk is bad or even money will always be scarce and hard to come by, right? Yes, don't spend too much on admin, right? Now, let's remember that this kind of mentality and culture in our organization affects every single decision that we make. So now I want us to imagine if you can turn that limiting belief about money into an empowering belief, I want you to flip your sentence on its head, share in the chat box, right? So if you're thinking about it, so are others. So it's helpful to understand that we just really aren't alone. We can flip these. So I'm going to use some of the examples I used before as people are thinking and putting in the chat box. So it might be our limiting belief might be we shouldn't charge fees for our programs or services. It might become, we can charge fees while still ensuring our programs always remain accessible, right? That limiting belief of any type of financial risk is bad might become, we take smart, calculated risk to test new ideas that can bring in new revenues, okay? Love this one by the uh, YWCA. Don't put too much time in for staff becomes staff deserve to make sustainable livelihoods. Love it. Risk must be shared by financial institutions and not only nonprofits, right? How about this one? Money will always be scarce and hard to come by. You know, that could become, we bring incredible value and can leverage our programs into fee-for-service and partnerships, okay? We can, yeah, build those car, uh, core volunteer teams and we can pay our staff adequately, right? That's our goal. So I really love that. Thanks for sharing, everybody. So this type of challenging, long-held beliefs 
is really how you start. And this reframing is a place to start to change the culture of money and risk inside your own organization, right? And I think the more we start to shift it in our organizations, we start to shift what's happening inside our sector, as well as the greater society and their thoughts about our sector. So everyone remembers the Thriving Nonprofits Honeycomb, yes? We talked about it a few minutes ago, okay? See some yeses? in my head anyway. <laughs> so let's use it to help set the stage for bringing in financial sustainability. When you begin to think about diversifying, an important exercise is to look at your current state of your revenue on each of these streams. Where is your dependency and where might there be opportunities to grow? This helps you understand the gaps and the potential pathways you like to move towards in the future to be more in control. I do want to be clear that grants and contracts are critical for our sector. However, it's also important to consider what's the right mix of both traditional and earned income strategies that will promote that financial sustainability, allow you to serve your mission well, and allow for a sufficient level of organizational independence. So for today, Let's focus our time because so many people have traditional strategies and, you know, through the program, the Thriving Nonprofits, we talk a lot about how do we make those enterprising, but I don't want to use our time here today on that. I really want to look about at what are the untraditional revenue sources that you can consider for your organization. So this is high level to get you thinking about what might be possible. So a good place to start when you're looking to increase income is to look at charging fees for your programs and services you are already offering. The potential to servicing a new paying market, potentially with the same need, or introducing a new program or service with a fee attached. And I appreciate that many nonprofits can struggle with the idea really of setting prices for their programs or services, especially if they've never charged fees at all in the past. So for many, the biggest psychological challenge is actually going from offering programs and services for free to charging any amount of money at all, even putting out a donation jar. So it's much easier within the culture of most organizations to move from charging $1 to charging $2 than it is to move from charging $0 to charging $1. And that really is based on what we, the exercise we did a bit earlier on the culture of money in your organization. So when it comes to charging fees for programs and uh, services, it's important to recognize that this can challenge underlying beliefs that organizations should shop, offer their programs and services for free. And when we begin to change this thinking in our organizations, it can cause some initial discomfort. So what are some of the situations that can come up and how could you think about them? You know, this really sits, this long house belief, this is the culture of what people believe. So look to have open communication about this with your staff, you know, as a staff team with your board. This communication is important. And it enables you to help others understand that the goal in charging fees is to increase the impact you can have. And although this may sound counterintuitive, but in thriving nonprofits, we have seen many examples over and over of organizations that have increased their programs or services impact by actually charging fees and never having a barrier to participate. Because that's key, of course, right? Because charging fees can also raise accessibility concerns. So for an example, how will people be able to access our programs or services if they have to pay? So you want to think this through and have a plan to figure out so that there is never a barrier to participating. It may also bring up concerns about reputation and about how our organization is perceived by the community and its stakeholders or funders. 
So can you be open and transparent on the belief, the benefits of the impact you can have and challenge this belief? And there may be other reasons why the idea of charging fees for programs and services could make you feel uncomfortable. I think it's really key to remember that it, when you charge fees, it doesn't necessarily mean the beneficiary of those programs and services is who's pay. There are a lot of different ways to sort of look at it. So it also may be others who's paying to support those programs and services. In the end, communication is key and sharing with others to help them understand the link between the revenue you bring in and how that will drive greater impact. Because the reality is nothing is really free and we know this, someone always has to pay. So if your existing funding or contracts does not cover the real whole cost of delivering your programs and services, then it's your organization is the one that will end up paying in the long run. And having our organizations cover these costs uh, or do without is very common tread in our sector. We heard it a, a little bit before. Um, earlier in the chat box, someone talked about, you know, keep having always being forced to keep our operations low, you know, our, our, our budgets low, our administration low, right? This is our organizations paying um, for compensate, uh, compensating for that. And we aren't able to have as much impact. Um, Christine, super appreciate that. There's lots of different models around that is not just a two tier paying schedule because yes, you never want to say help people feel that they're not able to pay. And there are certain programs and services you're never going to be able to charge fees on and that's okay. But it's thinking outside the box about what might be other markets that would be interested in the same services or who else is interested in making sure that beneficiary is served that way. Um, there might be, we, we've seen examples of organizations going from, okay, we know that uh, renters aren't able to afford this, but homeowners might be able to uh, afford uh, afford this, but they need the same thing. So how can we have a paying market over here and be able to use those resources to increase the impact we have on our uh, clients and beneficiaries and the community we serve that is not able to pay, okay? So it's really thinking of it around it in multiple ways, not just the um, way A to B. And I really appreciate um, that questions, that question. So the good news is that there's many ways that you can explore charging fees um, and really ensuring your values are kept deeply and that your programs and services are accessible. So this slide shares just eight different uh, fee strategies. Um, there are even more options than this. And like I said, you can always consider who is paying and that often it's not necessarily the end beneficiary is not the same person as who pays. So giving your time, team time to strategize on fee for service can really greatly increase your impact and bring in unrestricted revenues that can be used for operations and to support the people who need the access to a particular program of services. Okay. Liz, thanks for sharing that uh, sliding scale. That's that's one way to do it. Really appreciate that. Um, are you with me? Everyone's still with me? Yes? I'll get thumbs up and yeses. All right. Thank you. So we're going to go to the next one. Let's talk about social enterprise as another strategy nonprofits and charities can consider as an opportunity for owned income. So a social enterprise sells goods or services. They achieve environmental, social, or cultural impact and reinvest the majority of the profits into achieving their mission. So social enterprises uh, would use a business model to really earn revenue and achieve those impact goals. And they can be as varied as the mix and match of impact goals and business models can be. So there can be any kind of social enterprise. Social enterprises can also take different forms. They can exist within a nonprofit or a charity. They can be the organization itself. And they could be a for-profit business owned by the nonprofit or charity. 
So if you're thinking about social enterprise, you'll want to develop your plan to include, you know, there's required, required capital, capacity, and time to really succeed. Um, in thriving nonprofits, we really suggest organizations take a testing and iteration process instead of doing all the work, you know, and paying all those costs up front, you know, let's say for feasibility and business plans and all of that sort of stuff. Like if you can test and iterate, um, it really, really makes a difference. So we'd encourage you to think about that kind of approach. If you're starting a social enterprise from startup, this really reduces your risk because once you get it right through this testing and iteration process, your organizations will have customers when you open your social enterprise door. So are there any organizations here today that might have social enterprises or are considering social enterprise as a revenue strategy? We'll throw a yes in the chat box. So let us know we have some considering Really like, and yes, lots of different considerating and some people have them. So one other tip I would add is if you are exploring social enterprise as a revenue strategy, it's also worth asking the question, should we start a social enterprise or buy a business and shift it into a social enterprise? So when you look at the types of social enterprises that some many organizations want to start, a lot of them are what I would call main street businesses so that you would expect to see in most communities. So it might be cafes or grocery stores, thrift stores, or any of those kind of main street business yoga, like, you know, that we see in all our communities. So if your organization's main goal for social enterprise is to create revenue to support your mission, or if you can embed the impact you want to achieve inside an existing business model and convert it into a social enterprise, this means you can bypass the startup phase and may give you other benefits. And uh, it also helps support local businesses staying in your community. It can be a real win-win for all. And in Canada right now, there is a lot of baby boomers retiring and so this opportunity to purchase a business and embed social impact in it is a real one worth considering if you're going to be opening what I would call that main street business. Some social enterprises are completely unique to just the mission you serve. And so that one would have to go through that testing and iteration process through startup. But just a couple options to really think about. Yeah, the art galleries, the event rental spaces, exactly, the restaurants, all of those kind of ideas. We've got a ton of those kind of businesses up for sale. So the next revenue strategy in that thriving nonprofits honeycomb is assets. And so these can be both simple and more complex. So typically we think of assets as the financial items that show up on our organization's balance sheet. But did you know that many important assets inside and outside your organization are not likely to appear on your balance sheet? Okay, so we encourage you to, to really think differently about your assets. So to figure out your assets, you may want to think about assets as something that holds not just economic value, it might hold social value, cultural value, natural or ecological value and community value. So this invites your organization to see a much broader perspective and provides you with a new way to look at your organization's assets and what they might be. So I wanna give a few examples of other organizations so that we've seen in Thrive Nonprofits, we've seen so many, but here's some that you might just wanna think about that might bring into your own organization. So. Some of your assets are your staff uh, and volunteers, your space, whether it's leased, owned, or virtual, your networks and relationships, your brand and community, goodwill. Here's another one, your waste streams, right? Your tools and equipment, your IP, 
So love for anyone. If you can think like, just take a moment, let's take a moment and allow yourself to jot down right off the top of your head. What are some assets that might be in your organization? And if you want to share some in the chat box, that's always great um, because it gets others thinking about what might be possible in their organization. So what do you see as an asset in your organization? Meeting space, huge one. Staff, love it. The app we developed, exactly. So when you think broadly and creatively about your assets, you can be in the best position to create strategies to maximize their performance, their impact, and generate unrestricted revenue, right? There can also be power in thinking about combining your existing assets and combining them with others you might have, or combining them with other organize, organizational assets to create something, right? So you might have something, another brings a different asset, and so together you can create something new or even better. Love that. IP, network, space, equipment, your trade secrets, those are huge assets that we bring, okay? So let's talk about partnerships. How many here today use partnerships as a way of doing work or bringing in financial resources? And could your organization, thank you everyone. We see a lot of yeses there. Could your organization benefit from a partnership or more partnerships that can bring in more new revenue and resources? Yep. Yes and yes, Belinda, thank you, yep. Lots of it. Focus on nature says yes. Referrals from partners. We need more pearl, uh, partners that increases your referrals. Love that. So partnerships is another revenue strategy that you can explore to bring in new resources, both financial or to create cost savings that keep more resources in your operations. Um, I think of something like a distribution channel, for an example, that really lowers your cost if you have a partnership on how you distribute um, certain services that you might offer or materials that you need to get out, right? So we encourage organizations um, for you to really think about partnerships that are more than, can we have $5,000 sponsorship for an event, right? To what are your potential deep partnerships that create ongoing value? You might have partnership with another nonprofit, a business, or high net worth individual. So your partnerships may range in complexity from fairly straightforward, loosely held marketing alliances uh, to really deep multi-stakeholder agreements. So the greatest point you can remember when you're thinking about partnership, and this goes back to really challenging that traditional culture of our sector, is that your nonprofit offers several important values to potential partners. This is not about a handout. This is about the community goodwill, your per the perception of your organization, your reputation. There's some of the greatest benefits nonprofits can offer in a partnership. And so this is closely followed by your networks and influence of your board, your other relationships, your IP, your mission and your activities. So I want you to just take a moment and just really think and maybe jot down one thing you believe you bring into your partnership. Share it in the chat box. So we encourage, and I'm sure we'll get some really great sharing about the different things you bring into partnerships, but we encourage you when you're going through the part process of thinking about partnerships, Generate a list of your values. Love it, HR, knowledgeable staff, knowledge of community. Huge one, Laura, huge one, right? Cross promotion, the access to those who use your nonprofit, right? Really love that. So when you're thinking about um, what you bring in a partnership, generate your list of values and think about who a good partner is that needs these values, right? Then you can negotiate from a position of deeply understanding the benefits you're bringing into that partnership. And so this balances the power dynamic and the conversation and puts you as equals in that partnership negotiation. Because your organization is not looking for a handout, you're bringing immense benefit 
into that partnership. And that shift of thinking can really change things. So to pursue su successful partnerships in your organization, you'll need to understand how to do four key things. Understand your brand and reach is the most important. This will help you figure out good partnership opportunities and help you de demonstrate the benefits of partnering with your organization. You want to identify the right partnership alignment. You want to be able to use your value, your brand, your reach and alignment and craft a really effective value proposition is another key piece of the process. And the ability to both negotiate and manage partnerships successfully will really ensure mutually beneficial and lasting outcomes. Are you with me still? Everyone's with me? All right. Sounds great. So I'm hoping you're being able to make some great notes. So we're going to turn our heads to a slightly different way of thinking about sustainability. Leverage. Okay. This is the last revenue strategy in the thriving nonprofits honeycomb on these different kinds of strategies, right? Uh, this concept is a good exercise. And so the goal is to have your organization consider the money you are already spending and develop ways to drive increased impact through it. So think about all aspects of your organization. This will be thinking about your HR policies, to your operations, to what you purchase, where you bank, who you bank with, your banking in general, to any investments you might have, like your GICs. And the goal is to really think about how can you align the dollars you're already spending towards impact? When all of our activities and our operations are aligned towards impact, we can contribute further to solving the problems that we're trying to address and help increase the strength and impact of our whole sector. So we've talked a lot about revenue strategies you can attract and develop. And you've probably started to have, you know, some ideas around some of them, and that's great. Okay. So next up is really thinking about how do you choose the right ones and when to test them? So when choosing revenue strategies, there's five main criteria that can, that you can apply to your ideas. Okay. So firstly, time is important because you want to consider whether the resource needs of your organization are short-term, medium-term, or long-term. Different revenue strategies require a different amount of time. So that can help you order which ones you're going to do first, which one you're going to be working on uh, longer term, and which one you hope to be able to do sort of in that medium and long term. Culture is also that key consideration. We've been talking a bit about it throughout this whole session. So if your current culture is risk adverse and contains limiting beliefs about money, what can you do to help shift this thinking and integrate that new way of thinking away from scarcity into abundance throughout your whole organization and through your board? Okay. And so the ideas you identify, third thing, the idea you identify for each new strategy will all have varying levels of risk and return. So what are the easy ones that don't take much to implement? How could you do them now? Like what's those small tweaks you can do? And so what are the small steps you can also do at the same time, build your risk appetite towards those bigger strategies. And your organizations, what are they? Those existing capacities, strengths, and resources Concerning each strategy are important considerations. You're going to want to know what you need for those. So the other side is like, have you ever thought about what are your capacities and strengths in your organizations? Have you ever listed those out? You may be surprised at how many strengths you have in-house between all the different skills that sometimes we don't even know our staff actually, <laughs> actually has because they're doing one particular job. It's really fascinating to start to really list them out. And how can you surround yourself with others figuring this out or who have implemented revenue diversification uh, successfully? You know, they, they say about, you know, those top five people that you surround yourself with. And I really believe that as we're trying to shift into revenue diversification in our sector, how do you have a community 
that you can tap into, share your wisdom through, um, and really get strong together. So it might be a local group, right? It might be a community of practice that you belong to, or you might want to consider joining the thriving nonprofits community. So this is that online lab I, hub I was talking about that has over 600 leaders across our country. We're actively working towards financial sustainability. So individuals jump in to get an answer to a question in real time. They access free webinars and expertise as they figure it out. And it's that place you get to also share the expertise you bring with others. And lastly, impact. Of course, it's our critical one, right? You'll want to know that any strategy is supporting and enhancing your mission and the impact your organization is creating for the community you serve. So that's a lot of information and we did it quickly. Uh, did you get some good tidbits that you can you know, really start to just think about and bring into your organization? Uh, let me know in the chat box if you got a, you know, tidbits here or there that you can think about. And do you believe it's possible to transform your organization through revenue diversification? All right. Marissa, Sadeep, love that. Liz, Tupin, Laura, wonderful. So before, um, I want to make sure that you just know you're not alone. Right? And if you want to learn more about these strategies and how to transform your organization, I'll let you know that the Thriving Nonprofits cohort applications are now open for September. And the self-pace, the community hub, and the coaching are available at any time for individuals and organizations. Um, so there's a couple QR codes there. There's that. And because we value o and so amazing and the work they do in this sector, we really want for a limited time to really say, hey, have 50% off the self-paced model and uh, really just thank o and for uh, just bringing their members and all of us together. So um, that'll take you with the code to get your 50% off. And what we've really seen is organizations might want to use it to be able to Think about something now as they, uh, as individuals, they can support specific staff. They use it as a tool to help their board members, you know, start to think. Um, that cohort uh, applications that are open for September is a real organizational approach. So you would go together as an ED, a staff and a board member to go on that journey together and really think it through. So Really appreciate um, where we are. I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing and send it back to Kavita. Yeah, thanks, Christy. I know you went through a lot of information very quickly, <laughs> but um, folks will, uh, I know this has come up a few times again in the chat. Yes, you will get the recording so you can, you know, sort of Rewatch Christy give this presentation if you as you need um and yeah we have a few questions in the chat box so I'll sort of pose them to you um and I know that uh there have been some links shared for uh the discounted pre like program and thank you you know to scale for doing that and we will share those links in the follow-up email as well so you don't if you miss it now you will get it later um, so the first question was, what do you mean by contracts versus fee for service? Often when I think about, um, contracts, it's a lot of the government contracts, right? So we, we consider government or social procurement contracts. There's a lot of opportunities right now for, um, nonprofits or your social enterprise and charities to be able to tap into social procurement contracts. I know I didn't talk a lot about that, but that's how we start to think entrepreneurial in some of our contracts and look for other opportunities. Um, but often when we, the most, I'd say common in our sector is those government contracts. And so starting at, you know, at your municipal level, or maybe at a uh, contract at the health level, you know, as you build up your contract muscles, I would say, to go more complex into federal or um, 
uh, really across uh, across the country kind of contracts um, can really help. And I'd say the other option to think about too with contracts is it doesn't necessarily have to be, you don't have to lead it. Can you be a subcontract on a contract um, that allows you to bring in some resources now? which is really valuable. So with fee for service, it's really around those programs and services and activities that you might want to offer at um, different pricing scales, or you might have a different paying market versus a non-paying market. And that is a okay. So you might have a grant funded stream that's all to your particular beneficiaries, and you might have a paying market. Um, that is interested and affected by the same problem and they're looking for a solution and you bring that kind of expertise that can really solve it. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, is renting out your meeting room a source of revenue? It is, we've seen really creatively how people have rented out their space. I can tell you as an executive director, I, you know, I would rent out, um, I started renting out my space and it was, it was too small. We were too small to begin with, um, our location, but I would think about, I started to think about it differently. I started to think about it in a 24 seven space. Mm. I was like, oh, you know, we have this door and we have this kitchen here. There's a lot of bakers that want access at 4 a.m. in the morning, right? which is something I hadn't thought about. Then I started looking around and I was like, oh, we've got this parking lot and we have these fields. What can we do on these spaces that are surrounding us to generate unrestricted revenue from markets to events to um, to different ideas? We rented to, um, and you know, this is only appropriate for some. I was a community center and we built a market. We had a hundred... 100 square 100 meter square foot very it, it was very small this area and we rented it out to our, our local craft brewery who would bring and come to the market we generated so much revenue from that small square it was incredible in comparison to even what you know the whole entire market could do so just really thinking about your uh, space creatively you know sometimes we think about it when we're open Right. So if you're open nine to five, what happens in your space after five? Right. Lots of different ways to think about space. Virtually, um, you have different accesses to your networks, um, to um, so I think about that. Um, how do you it might be a blog that you allow them to write. There's lots of different ways to think about space that you have virtually um, and, and whether you rent it or not, Lisa. Yeah, that's so I love good. it. Look at Liz shared that great idea. They had a garage, they didn't use it, now yeah. they rent it, right? So it's just sometimes we don't realize our space in, in this massive way, but it's a great asset. Yeah. For sure. Um, so the other question was, is there a ratio you'd recommend for financial sustainability between earned revenue and the other traditional sources? What a great question. I love it. Um, I think it's actually, it's, it's for each organization, it's a little different. I would say if you are really heavy on any one stream, it's a vulnerability in your organization, especially the, the traditional ones. We know, we, you know, we've worked with uh, thriving nonprofits. I'm just trying to think of some examples. Um, I know one organization, you know, three quarters of their budget, even though they were a million or plus was two government contracts right? It's a huge vulnerability. We had another organization that, you know, was um, given, I think it was, you know, about 600,000 every year from one high net worth individual, but that represented, you know, an incredible amount of over 75% of their revenue. It was a vulnerability because then that, you know, high net worth individual changed. So, I would say my, I like to like, can I hover at 50% grants and contracts and the rest of it's earned revenue? That makes me feel really comfortable. That's my comfortable spot. Um, but it will be different for different organizations. So I think when you look at those different streams, really, you'll start to notice over time, we do this really interesting exercise in thriving nonprofits where people um, get a visual and they see their trends. Um, and it's really fascinating to see over time, you know, and you can, uh, 
figure this out over time, where your vulnerabilities are, like where you sit on the trends of all the different strategies, which sometimes can help you, really helps you be able to be like, okay, I want to go up 15% over here in fee for service. I want to do 20% um, from, you know, uh, our assets. I'm going to reduce grants by 30%. And so you start to be able to be like, visually be like, this is how I'm going to balance it. Right? And I think that's the piece, the balance and what you're comfortable with is the most important part. Okay, so I'm going to do two more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, so uh, one of the participants wondering if you could elaborate more on the leverage part. They didn't quite understand. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting that. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, really think about going through a process. Um, of really think about going through a process of looking at all your sides. So we create a ton of impact, I would say, mainly through our activities. So those are our programs, our services. So our organizations are already 25% aligned, for sure. Um, then we can look at our HR policies. Do we have, uh, are they impactful to the people we employ, right? Um, so I would say some of that is, do you do sick days or wellness days? You know, there, what are the kind of small shifts you can make that allows it to be, um, is there flexibility, um, for people that, um, I don't know, might have children or a dog or dentist, you know, all of these places were humans. Um, and looking at that, um, the other thing I would think of in HR, I love this story. I We worked with a group of organizations through the program and they were kind of, uh, they were, they were all located very close together, which meant they all got waste management to pick up their garbage. They all got the, the same company to pick up their, their uh, compost. And so they started and each were paying separately. So they looked together and they were like, wow, like between us, this is a massive contract for uh the waste management so they went and um and went and was they kind of got together said let's go and they went and said we want to keep this you know we want you to keep this contract because we have choices in our waste management right um but in order to do that we would like two people with barriers to employment to be employed through your company um at all times so they were able to leverage what they were already spending to support people with barriers to employment to get employment. So it's, and that's just one example. It's just really thinking creatively, like we spend these dollars, how do we increase the social and environmental culture we can have through it? I would say banking is a huge one. Do you know what your bank does with your money? Because the impact that you are having is where your money is sitting um, and what they're doing with it. So are they aggravating the problem that you are trying to solve in your organization or not, right? And what are the financial products that they create for nonprofits and charities that support your work, right? And that are tailored. By, so these are questions we can start to ask. You know, we've developed partnerships with our, um, anyway, uh, to like, how do yes, we- Yes, sorry, I know. But I'm sure you have so many examples. Time. I just want to get to one more question. For and sure. then we can so, I could chat about this strengthening our sector forever. <laughs> it's actually great. And I think everyone is really appreciative of that. Um, what's the difference between fee for service and a social enterprise? Can my social enterprise provide a service? Uh, yes. So the probably the most question we get, uh, you know, that that's <laughs> it's a huge question. I would say you can think about fee-for-service as those programs that you have that um, are probably grant-funded, right? And you might um, be able to think about a fee-for-service strategy around different markets. Um, or, um, you know, we've got youth leaving care. Quick, youth leaving care, uh, youth going to university. Um, they both are having housing challenges. Right. So do you have something that services youth and care that you could sell over here to youth going to university that um, can pay that helps you support your other market? OK, so there that's just sort of I'm just thinking fee for service. A social enterprise mm -hmm. is really um, it is a business like endeavor. It sells products or services 
and it has impact inside the DNA. Like the whole reason for that social enterprise is impact. So that means if you have, um, if you buy a business, that's okay. Cause it might be that you buy a, a cafe. And again, you're employing people. You're doing training programs through that. Um, you're, you're embedding your social impact in that, but the real, the whole reason for the social and en enterprise to exist is that impact. So it's rarely, it might start with being grant funded and that might be the social aspect that you're funding, but it really is an earned revenue and it's really buying and selling. Uh, there's a, that uh, customers on products and services. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, so I know there's a few more questions left and sorry folks that we've sort of run out of time. Um, I will say Come thank join you us in the community Christy. and we'll talk about it. Yeah. yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Thanks Christy for leading this workshop. You've provided us really great insights on, you know, how revenue diversification works, but also again, that mind shift um, and to think more creatively. Uh, and thank you to our participants for joining us. We hope you found this useful. We will email you the recording as well as links to key resources within a week. So take care and have a great afternoon. Thank you again, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye.